And uh, let's welcome Stephen to kick this off. Thank you. Good afternoon. So I'm Stephen Brenner. And on behalf of my co-organizers, Andrea Skywitz, Yu Shah, and Mark Gerstein, it's a pleasure to have you join us here for the Nobel Prize celebration special session. This session celebrates the continuing scientific legacy of Michael Levitt, who was one of the recipients of the 2013 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And this is an important distinction for him, but as he's the first to point out, it's also more broadly an extremely important recognition for our field of computational bi biology generally. Now, Michael regrets that he can't be here. Um, he's currently attending a celebration of the 50th anniversary of the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, where he got his own PhD and where he was on the scientific staff for many years, and then a conference that he organized over a year ago, and so wasn't able to join us here. Um, but Michael does have a long history with ISMB, having been involved with um, his lab's involvement in the organization of the very second ISMB meeting some 20 years ago. And also, he himself has authored several papers with members of his lab that have been in ISMB proceedings. So Michael stated that the work that got him the Nobel Prize was actually done before he even started his PhD back in the 1960s. Um, but his scientific contributions did not end a half century ago. And this session is intended to reflect his greater scientific legacy. In particular, it's going to focus on the science of those whom he mentored. So these are all people who were his past and present group. And so talk about science that he helped mature, science that he inspired. And I think as he said on the day that he received the Nobel Prize, they'd gone to sleep the night before, excited about the work that had been done in his lab the very last week. And so he's always been excited about the science that's currently ongoing, and that is what we'll be focusing on here. In fact, when Michael was trying to recruit me, he told me that he ran his group as a mini department where he provided funding for everybody and basically let them do their own research. And he really did that and it worked. The only thing was that every week at group meeting, he would come in and he'd present what he did. And basically what he would have done himself was more than all the rest of us combined. Um, any of you who know Michael know that he's a very adventurous person in sort of every way. Another anecdote is that one of the first things he told me about as I was thinking about joining his lab was that he had recently calculated his average ground speed over the course of the previous year. It was 50 miles an hour. Um, that he spent a lot of time in the air traveling between Stanford and Israel. He spent a lot of time doing many other things. Um, but despite his frequently being away, that he was an incredibly generous and an incredible advisor. And it was truly an honor for me to have the opportunity to study with him. And this is a picture taken at a celebration for his um, 60th birthday. And you can see here how many people came to join him. Um, actually, here also is his collaborator. Cyrus Chothia, who was my PhD advisor, Arya Warshall, as well as many of his um, colleagues and students and former postdocs. And I hope that over the course of this session, you'll come to have an appreciation for Michael's larger scientific legacy as well. So that brings me to introducing our first speaker, who will be Mark Gerstein. Now, there's only a half hour for this slot, and it would take me more than that much time to give a complete introduction to all his accomplishments. And besides, I wouldn't be able to remember all of them or even be able to read all of them. Um, but it turns out that much of his academic history is easy to recall, as you're going to see. Um, Mark grew up in Essex County, New Jersey, as did I. Um, he then went to Harvard College, and so did I. Um, he then got a Herschel Smith Harvard scholarship to study at Manual College at the University of Cambridge, so did I. He then chose to work with Cyrus Chothia at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, where he did his PhD research, and so did I. That part's you know, not quite so surprising because we actually had both come from Harvard and actually got some similar advice. He then did his postdoctoral work with Michael Levitt at Stanford, and so did I. And again, this was following a well-trod path because Michael and Cyrus Chothia worked together for a long time together, um, including Michael himself having been at the LMB for quite a while, as I mentioned. Um, and then Mark finally got, a fi finally got a faculty position at a university whose color was Yale blue, and so did I. I'm at UC Berkeley, but a little known fact is that the university's colors are gold for the gold rush and 49ers, Sutter's Mill, and so on, and Yale blue because the founders of the University of California were alumni and had been at Yale, and they brought that color as their insignia color there as well. So we share a color. Um, at his institution, Mark has gone on to become chair of their computational biology program, and so did I. 
And then Mark studies protein structure and function, integrative surveys, cross-species genomics and evolution, gene expression, biological databases, and genetic expression, and gene, expression gene variation, um, and so do I. He was also named a AAAS fellow about five years ago, and so was I. Um, but our stories are not exactly the same. Um, here's how we differ. Well, for starters, we didn't marry the same person, but it was a good thing his wife had an identical twin. No, that's actually not true, um, but we do have two daughters. Um, and this being Boston, I also have to concede that there is some difference in how we both graduated from Harvard. Um, Mark was among the very few who graduated summa cum laude, and I was not. Um, and it might seem sort of irrelevant to mention this detail half a life, that's from over half a lifetime ago. Um, but this being Harvard, this distinction will be remembered, and my lack of that distinction and his presence of that distinction will be someday emblazoned upon our Harvard obituaries. Uh, a few other things, um, that for years when one did a Google search, or actually I think an Alta Vista search back in that day, um, for the Journal of Molecular Biology, the top hit you would receive would be Mark Gerstein's publications page. He now is nearing 500 publications, and many of these are extremely important. I've been told his age index is now over 100, and it's a pleasure to have him talk to us now about human genome analysis. So um, I want to thank uh, Stephen uh, very much for the uh, very entertaining uh, introduction. Um, and uh, so now I'm going to go on to just tell you a little bit about um, uh, what I'm doing now on analyzing the uh, human genome. But before I do that, <laughs> I'm going to back up a little bit and tell you about a little bit of my uh, personal um, recollections of working with Michael. So, um, as Stephen said, I was a postdoc with Michael from 1993 to 1996. And when I was there, I focused uh, mostly on the on sort of molecular mechanics, um, you know, one of the things that Michael is obviously focused on. And, you know, I worked with uh, Jerry Sai in the audience of Michael, and this is, I worked on, say, uh, water simulation, liquid simulation. And during the time I was there, I got really excited in, uh, you know, mid 1990s by these, uh, the things we heard about in the, uh, the last, the keynote talk about this whole genome assembly of, at that time it was um, bacteria, the first genome, Haemophilus influenza. And so Michael, as Stephen alluded to, really gave all the people in his lab a lot of freedom uh, to look at all sorts of different things. And so I took advantage of that freedom. And um, I started exploring this and it turned into my, really my kind of first analysis of uh, genomics, which I did with Michael in 1997. And so now I'm going to tell you about kind of where this uh, kind of uh, direction has taken me. And I should mention parenthetically in talking about my background, I was, you know, I, I found out this morning that when we were hearing about the um, Nobel Prizes for Martin Karplus and Ari Varshall, that one of them was um, described by Ronald Dumbrack. Uh, he, he shared up the same, um, in, in many respects, the same background that Stephen and I did being an undergraduate at Harvard. And also, I think what's also important to say is that as undergraduates, we were really influenced by Martin Karplus as well. I mean, Martin Karplus was really um, one that steered me a, a, at the very beginning on this course. He um, really suggested that I get into this um, field, and I think it's really quite amazing to see the force of both him and uh, Michael on my life and other people's lives. Um, with that, I'll begin, oops, let's, oops, telling you about um, just a particular problem I'm working on now. And so the problem I'm doing now is really trying to take all this uh, genomic analysis that's now really come to uh, fruition and use it for practical ends, to try to prioritize the um, many mutations you have in a cancer genome. Because as you all know, cancer to a large degree is manifest as a disease of the genome. The average uh, cancer genome maybe has 1,000 to 10,000 somatic uh, alterations. And that's uh, a lot less than the number of germline alterations, but it's too many to study individually. So what we want to do is find the important mutations that are really giving rise uh, to uh, driving the cancer. And the way we're going to do that is look at each mutation through the lens of um, genome annotation. And there's sort of two main sources you can broadly for thinking of genome annotation. One is just kind of comparative genomics, looking for regions in the genome that are highly conserved, uh, either between human and other organisms, just between humans, or even within the human genome. And the second thing is various functional assays on the uh, genome, uh, looking at which regions of the genome are transcribed, bound to, and so forth. 
And as you well know, a lot of the bioinformaticians, we take the noisy readout from these functional assays and turn them into kind of neat uh, annotation blocks. And a lot of this uh, work on looking at genome variation and um, uh, sort of genome annotation has been, takes place in these large uh, big science consortium. Uh, one of them is the ENCODE uh, consortium, which has had a number of um, publications over the years. And uh, also there's the Thousand Genomes Consortium, which has looked a lot at uh, genome variation. So I'm going to be telling you about work now that really is a product of um, both of those consortia coming together in a sense. So I'm going to kind of zip through this talk quickly. I might um, skip a little bit because of time, but basically what I'm going to do is talk about how we can put together the genome annotation with the variation to find regions in the genome that are very sensitive to mutations. And then I'm going to talk about how we can use network connectivity to also find regions that are very sensitive to mutations. And finally, I'm going to talk about how we can put those two facts together to prioritize cancer mutations and potentially identify cancer drivers. So first, I'm going to start off by just introducing a number of different categories of genes. Some um, are very sensitive to mutations. We know that if there's a, um, a mutation in them, uh, it often leads to uh, death um, at a very young age. Others are very insensitive to mutations. You, pr you probably know that one of the fruits of the Thousand Genomes Project was finding these hundreds of genes that could be homozygously inactivated in, in, a, in a healthy individual. And they, and in the middle are genes that are maybe associated with uh, GWAS hits that have some association with the disease, but not as uh, strong. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to try to um, develop a measure of um, selection. Now, uh, traditionally, people might look at selection in terms of looking at the conservation between a region between different organisms. And here you might see, for instance, a, a fixed uh, difference that might maybe differ between two different organs, but the region being conserved. Now, when we look in the human population, it's a little bit uh, different and a little bit less intuitive. What we're actually going to do is we're going to look for regions of the genome that have, that, ha that have less common variation in them than you might expect, okay? And so the idea is there'll be, there'll be less common variants in them, but what that actually means is that there's an elevation of rare variants. So we're actually going to look for regions of the genome that have an elevation of rare variants um, compared to other regions. Now, when we look at this uh, metric for selection in terms of these kind of categories of genes, we sort of see what we might expect where the um, loss of function tolerant genes have the uh, lowest fraction of rare uh, SNPs and the essential genes have the highest fraction. And this is on um, genes in the genome. Now, what we want to do is go into the non-coding regions and look at how um, selection manifests itself there. And here, what we find is that what people have found before, that the non-coding regions of the genome, the functional regions, tend to be under a sort of weak type of selection, but it's very weak, okay? So here's, for instance, all the coding regions, and here's their fraction of rare SNPs, and here are the, the broad non-coding categories. And you can see they're slightly elevated over the genomic baseline, but only a little bit. And the implication, of course, is that, well, the non-coding regions really aren't doing that much, and that mutations in them maybe aren't um, have such a great effect. But one thing we can do with the, essentially the statistical power of the Thousand Genomes Project is we can break these very broad categories, for instance, um, transcription factor binding sites or enhancers and so forth, up into much more specific categories. For instance, transcription factor binding sites associated with a particular type of factor, such as HMG or forkhead and so forth. And there we see there's a great difference in selection in each of these categories, with some categories being under somewhat stronger selection than the others. And we can further, even for the transcription factors, we can even look at um, how the, the mutation affects the actual transcription factor binding motif. Does it disrupt the motif or does it actually form it better? And we can actually see that the degree of selection uh, parallels whether the um, mutation disrupts or not the motif. And we can look at the uh, differential selection on sites that are active in different tissues, seeing, for instance, that brain uh, regions tend to be under slightly stronger selection than, say, lung or liver regions, okay? And overall, what we're able to do is we're able to identify a group of non-coding 
um, categories that are under almost as strong selection as coding regions. And we call these um, the sensitive and ultra-sensitive regions. And we pick these somewhat arbitrarily to be about the same size as an exome. So this is a sort of region of the genome about the size of an exome that's under fairly strong selection. And when we look at the known disease-causing mutations, we see they're highly enriched to be in these sensitive and ultra-sensitive regions. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm going to skip over this a little bit here and, and just say that we found that a very similar pattern for other types of variation, such as structural variation and indels, though, it's, of course, these types of variation are a little bit more complicated than um, single nucleotide uh, variants. Okay, now I'm just going to very quickly then talk a little bit about how we can use networks to prioritize mutations. Remember the two the categories of genes I talked about earlier, in particular the loss of function tolerant genes versus the essential genes. Now, if we just look at their connectivity in, uh, say, well-known network, the regulatory network, we see that overall the essential genes tend to have slightly higher connectivity, and this is a very well-known and um, a fact that. Um, sort of more connectivity is associated with more constraint in networks. But you see it's very weak. It's not sufficient to really separate these two groups of genes. But if we look at another network, say the protein interaction network, we'll see the same pattern, okay? And actually we get an even better signal when we don't look in the protein interaction network, we look in the network of resolved structural interfaces. You see that we start to get separation between these two groups. And so what we thought to do is to combine all the existing networks, the regulatory network, metabolic network, uh, protein interaction networks, and so forth, into something we call a multi-net, which is a huge mega network, which has about 100,000 um, interactions amongst the human genes. And the key thing is in this multi-net, we get a very nice separation um, between uh, these two different gene categories. And so, the, and we can use this very good separation as another feature to discriminate things that are very sensitive to mutations from not. In fact, you can even see the separation when you look at the network. This is a very big network, but you can kind of see how the essential genes are sort of in the higher connectivity parts of the network than the loss of function tolerant genes. Okay, so I've kind of put out two facts, one that we can find very sensitive regions in the genome uh, through putting together the ENCODE annotation and the 1,000 GMS variants, and we can also prioritize um, very disruptive mutations based on their network connectivity. And so now what I want to do is try to put these two things together um, and make a kind of practical workflow for um, interpreting cancer uh, genomes. And so what we did is we took uh, about, oh, a little, about 85 or 90 uh, cancer genomes, uh, mostly prostate and breast cancer genomes. And we looked at all the um, somatic variants, and like I said, on, on average, these genomes have maybe 2,000 somatic variants in each. And most of these somatic variants, the overwhelming uh, majority of them, occur in non-coding regions, about, as you might expect. About 99% of them occur in non-coding region. And, and I should say this is, you might say, well, it makes a lot of sense to really look at the, uh, the non-coding functional effect of these uh, variants, but actually, historically, uh, cancer genomics and cancer sequencing has been very, very protein-oriented. I mean, most of the TCGA sequencing up to now has focused on exomes um, predominantly, and there's been only a few well-documented examples of non-coding regions that really give rise to cancer drivers, the prominent one being, of course, the mutations in the TERT promoter that were studied by Levi uh, Garroway. So we put these facts that I described earlier to you together into a practical workflow. So we take the cancer mutations, we, we screen out the natural uh, variants, and then we see, okay, do they intersect a uh, functional non-coding region? Uh, this is a bit of the ENCODE annotation. And then what we say is, do they intersect the sensitive and, and ultra-sensitive parts of this annotation? Then if they hit a... Um, transcription factor binding site, we say, oh, do they disrupt the motif? Do they break the motif or hit exactly in the motif? And if they do, we upweight them more. And then we come to say, finally, do they sit in some sort of network hub? Do they sit in a regulatory network hub? 
And obviously, if things make it all the way through this sort of filter, we'd say these mutations have a potential to be very disruptive. And then, of course, we can look at the recurrence of these mutations, not exactly at the same spot, but within the same um, annotation um, across a number of cancer samples. And so we built a little tool we call uh, FunSeq uh, to do this. And I'll show you the operation of this uh, tool now. So now this uh, schematic shows the application of the tool to one particular prostate cancer genome. This is from the Berger et al. paper, the original prostate cancer sequencing paper. And let me just give you some of the key numbers. There's about 1,800 somatic mutations in here. And when we filtered out all the known polymorphisms, we only ended up with about 1,700. So that's a lot of uh, mutations. But then we kind of walk our way through that decision tree that I kind of talked about, and we find that we start to get to very small numbers. There's only three that really hit the ultrasensitive regions, and then only one of those three is in an ultrasensitive region that's a hub, and that that one actually recurs. Okay, so now what we've done is we've reduced the roughly 2,000 mutations into one that we really believe um, is very deleterious. And the nice thing about that small number of one is that someone can actually go and validate that. And so we were very lucky to have a collaboration with Mark Rubin, who's a cancer specialist in New York, and he was able to validate the recurrence of this on an independent cohort of um, samples by sequencing them and found that this mutation did uh, recur. And we can also see if, it dis if this mutation, which occurs in a um, regulatory region, um, disrupts the expression of its downstream gene, and lo and behold, it does. It occurs in the promoter of WDR74, and here is the expression of the, that gene in prostate cancer versus in uh, benign. And so we have an example of this workflow of finding a particular mutation which might be a driver in cancer. And so let me just summarize what I've talked about here. Uh, so what I've talked about is, uh, I guess originally I started off as more of a structural person, and I in Michael's lab, I got interested in genomics, and I started, I guess, working on, um, um, you know, sort of uh, bacterial genomes, small organism genomes, and eventually I got into human genomics, and now I've talked about how we're trying in the lab to, to get some practical fruits from this analysis of human genomics. And I talked about how we could take the genome annotation the, and the patterns of natural variation and use them to prioritize cancer mutations. And first, I talked about developing these ultra-sensitive and sensitive regions that are particularly sensitive to mutations, also being able to characterize disruptive non-coding mutations in uh, motifs um, by looking at the patterns of natural variation and finding things that are most counter to it. Then I talked about prioritizing things based on network connectivity, finding, uh, finding that hubs are more um, disrupted by mutations. And then I talked about building a practical uh, workflow and how we can use this to find drivers in uh, cancer genomes. And so now I'd like to um, acknowledge the um, uh, many people I've worked with on this. Now this work uh, took place within the framework of these uh, big science groups. So it took place as formerly part of the Thousand Genomes Project, which for people in it, there's probably a lot of people in this room are part of Thousand Genomes. It's also known as the Thousand Authors uh, Project. You, you discover that everyone is an author of Thousand Genomes. And it, formerly, this is a, it was part of a subgroup of Thousand Genomes called the Functional Interpretation Subgroup, or FIG. It actually uh, really was originally called the Functional Annotation Group, but we decided that FIG was probably a better name for it. And then, um, the, the group has the members that I showed here in green. In particular, I think one of the leaders of it was Hector Carana, who is a research scientist in my lab, soon to go on to a faculty position, and Jasmine Mew, who's a graduate student, um, who's now moved to the Broad, and Yao Fu, uh, who's a graduate student with me. And it was a collaboration also with Chris Dollar Smith uh, at the Sanger Center, and Haiwan Yu at um, uh, Cornell our university, and we had this kind of connection with a lot of the cancer people headed by Mark Rubin at uh, Weill Cornell. And with that, I'll thank you very much for your attention. Uh, any questions? Oh, sure. out of the uh, 1800. 
So uh, I was wondering, like, uh, to identify the functions of the rest than 99% of the uh, variance, uh, what would you suggest that would be the way uh, to do? Oh, well, no, so that's a very good question. So the question was, if we took our 1,800, we boiled it down to one, what happens to the other 1,799? We, we certainly prioritize those two. We give you a big rank list, right, that ranks all the way from the top at the, you know, of the, the most, all the way to the bottom. Now, the mindset in cancer, which is, it, I would just say it's a hypothesis, the mindset in cancer is that most cancers arrive from a few driver mutations, and most of those 1,800 mutations are just random garbage. Or ra random, um, garbage is not the right word, but sort of random products of, you know, sort of aberrant um, replication and so forth. And so the mindset is if we find that those few keys, that's all we need to do. Though we do prioritize and give some form of functional annotation to the other ones as well. Um, but if uh, a lot of those 1,799 are occurring at the transcription factor binding sites or at important regions of the genome, essentially they could have regulatory effects downstream. And uh, so they are not really nonsensical in that sense. They, they, do have, they do have a signaling effect or other things which could be taken into account from a drug discovery standpoint per se. No, that's, that's correct. I mean, there, there's a whole debate, you know, obviously in the, the cancer community about, you know, how to think about these things. I, I think the one mindset, and I, I, I'm, I'm no oncologist, so I'm, I have to be careful if I'm getting this right, but I, I think one mindset is that, you know, remember, cancer is starting with a very few mutations, and then the cells kind of go haywire, and you get lots and lots of um, uh, changes. And the idea is that if you really want to target your drug or something like that, you want to target at those, th those first few key mutations that are really driving the cancer or something, unless the product of sort of aberrant rep replication. Though it, though it could be, I mean, like I said, it could easily be that many of these um, later subsequent mutations are equally important. And, you know, there's a lot of discussion of treating the cancer with drugs, and then you find that the relapse um, tumor also often is really driven by very different mutations, and they could be very important as well. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.